Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today, Mr. Wendell Minnick, joins us from Taipei, Taiwan, where he is senior Asia correspondent for Shepherd Media Military. He previously was bureau chief for Defense News and worked for Jane's Defense Weekly. Hey, Wendell, good to see you. Welcome to Asian Review. Well, thanks a lot, Bill. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, let's uh, get right into it then. Um, now, every year you go to the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, and this year you were there again. So what was your take of this year's Shangri-La Dialogue? Well, every year uh, you go, it's a little different. Um, this year there was a smaller Chinese delegation. Um, there were some angry words expressed by the Chinese delegation members who were there regarding General Mattis' comments regarding Taiwan arms sales. Um, that was pretty much all the excitement uh, that, uh, that occurred at this particular one. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, was anything said about Admiral Harris? Because it's a, a pretty well known that the Chinese don't care for him. And um, in, in fact, there's some rumors that the Chinese ambassador to the U.S., uh, Tsui Tiankai, requested to have Admiral Harris replaced. Was there any, any talk about Admiral Harris at the Shangri-La Dialogue? Not too much. Uh, I don't think that um, Harris is a major challenge to Shangri-La. Uh, I don't understand the full reason why they feel like they have the right to tell him or tell anyone that we have to replace someone. Um, that miffs me, too. I have to admit, that one kind of gets me boiling. <laughs> The Chinese uh, are becoming a little more aggressive in what their demands are like. Um, for example, recently they demanded that the South Koreans allow them to inspect the THAAD missile batteries. Um, that uh, is very strange. Uh, that's very cocky, um, <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to tell another country that is technically your enemy uh, that you want to inspect their missile batteries. Uh, it doesn't make much sense. So. No, I'm, I'm right with you on that. I, I think that is terribly arrogant of the Chinese when they demand that a, a, the Pacific commander be replaced and they demand open an open inspection of the THAAD, or as they call it, the SADA, in South Korea. Uh, um, I, I did hear the U.S. sort of countered and said, yeah, okay, fine, let us inspect your um, strategic missile forces or something like that. Yeah, they don't really understand quid pro quo. Um, when you talk to the Chinese about reciprocal relations, they don't really understand it. They always use the expression that they are a poor nation that's learning the ropes, that um, that the rules, international rule, rules of behavior were written before they came along, therefore they weren't consulted. Therefore, they don't have to, go, you know, necessarily um, go by these rules, and they'll just go along with any way they feel like going. Uh, so uh, that's a huge problem. Um, they break the rules that they don't want to use, and they follow the rules that are oh, that that give them some advantage. I would agree with that. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Well, um, what's the talk in Taiwan about um, a new U.S. arms package to Taiwan? Now, when Obama, in, in the closing days of the Obama administration, there was, um, it was said that the U.S. had put together an arms package and was going to get it delivered to Taiwan before Obama left office, and then that didn't happen. And Trump came in, and uh, supposedly the arms package was still on but now we don't hear anything about it. So what's the what's this what's the, what's the story around Taiwan? What are people uh, concerned with defense issues in Taiwan saying about this arms package? Uh, they're looking at at uh, mid to mid year, which actually it is already mid year. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. 
ironically, I've been saying this for a while, but uh, the problem is, is that many of the folks that, that are supposed to be appointed to posts have not been appointed yet. Uh, Deputy Secretary, Under Secretary, all these positions are vacant, um, largely for political reasons. Uh, and until some of these positions are filled and policy is made, um, there's going to be a hold up on a whole range of issues, not just Taiwan. Uh, mm. But on the items that they want to sell Taiwan, one of them is the M1 Abrams tank. Um, this one has been going on for 20 years, uh, the request. And uh, the United States does have a large arsenal uh, of M1 Abrams tanks. They continue to build for no reason at all. So uh, I suspect that that will go forward. It's the wrong tank for Taiwan. Um, Taiwan, as you know, is a high mountain range uh, with low wetland coastlines. And the bridges are old, some of them, and they have earthquakes and mudslides. And a big tank like that doesn't uh, move around very easily. Mm. And uh, they'd use a completely different kind of ammunition, uh, which costs more money. Uh, so, but they still want the M1 Abrams tank. Uh, they're still pushing for it, and it'll probably be released. Yeah, that, that, I, I agree with you on that. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, because, uh, as you suggested, the Abrams is really heavy. And probably Taiwan's bridges, after being weakened by so many uh, earthquakes and typhoons, really probably can't hold them up, can't, hold, uh, can't support them. And it, it, there, there's a, I think Taiwan needs a medium-sized tank. Well, they, you know, they have the M60s and M48s they built here. Um, and they switched turrets on them, and they've done all kinds of things with them. Um, they're not going to have a land battle here with the Chinese when they invade. Mm. Um, that's not going to happen. So why they want these M1 Abrams is unclear. Um, no, you know, I can certainly understand why they would want paladins, you know, or something, you know, a mobile amphibious, a mobile uh, artillery force um, in that range of 105. Um, but a tank is a whole different matter. You have to have a lot of uh, maneuverability. And they only have one or two places left in Taiwan where they can maneuver. They have tank bases. Mm. Um, a lot of the land is being scooped up by developers. They only have one artillery range now. Uh, That's land in on Pingdong? Land. In uh, they have artillery um, places along the coast and for the water, but they only have one land-based one. Mm. So, um, the military here is sort of falling apart um, in terms of where to go to train. Um, Singapore sends troops here to train, um, but Taiwan still needs more room. Well, let me ask you this about this uh, arms package. Um, rumors uh, that... Uh, well, I guess it's more than a rumor. Is Taiwan really would like to have an, the F-35s? Is there any chance of them getting the F-35s? You know, my crystal ball is broken on that one. Um, <laughs> you know, I have some of the original paperwork from um, the Defense Security Cooperation Agency, the ones who handle the FMS. I have some of this material. I probably shouldn't have it, but I have it. And, and it talks about 120 F-35s and 60 F-35Bs. So that's an A and a B. And that was that was 20 years ago. So they certainly have a requirement because we expect the runways to, to be destroyed by China's service short-range uh, ballistic missiles. And... Um, and bunker busters will knock out a lot of the the what was thought originally as impenetrable bases like Walian Air Base, which is all inside a mountain. Um, yeah, Taiwan's a very interesting place. A lot of their bases are inside mountains. It has that very James Bond sort of feel to it. Um, you expect to see a guy in a, with a white cat in a wheelchair roll around the corner. Um, but it, they they have uh, they have a pretty good defensive mindset. 
unfortunately, technology is is offsetting that considerably. You know, um, I was reading something the other day, and and it, it was an evaluation of the F thirty five, and it was a pretty dim evaluation. It was saying that really the the plane is way overrated. And if you take an F-35 and you compare it to an F-16C, F-16 Charlie, that actually mm -hmm. the F-16 Charlie comes out a lot better. Now, I know Taiwan only has the A's and B's, but um, it wasn't too long ago they were really screaming for the uh, C's and D's. 51's, yeah. Um, yeah, that was a really sad story, too, because they could have had those CDs before um, well, what they got was a refurbishment package for their current ABs, and that's going to take a long time, five, something like five years per squadron. So, you know, it's going to be 20, 20, 20, 20 years, 25 years before they'll have all the refurbishments done. Um, that's a terrible waste of time, and, and China's coming, so you don't really have time to mess around with refurbishment of these aircraft. Mm. The F-35B, the problem with the F-35B is that it's really an untested platform in combat. Um, since it first came out, technology has has advanced, and our ability to see these aircraft in the air has advanced. And the F-35s, uh, you know, they're built all over the world, the parts and manufacturing, and and I have countless files in my my file cabinet of F-35 spy stories that involve the mainland Chinese. So I suspect the platform has been completely um, well acquired and uh, may very well be flying around as, as the J, uh, J-31 uh, inside China. <laughs> That's an interesting comment because when you see pictures of Chinese combat aircraft, they have a striking similarity to either the F-22 or the F-35. J-31 particularly, uh, the single engine was the original design and there it is flying around. Um, I saw the. I've seen both aircraft fly in China. Um, the uh, the bigger one, the J twenty, doesn't look, doesn't have much maneuverability, and they're most likely what will be used for strike, long range strike missions like Guam or maybe Hawaii. They can make it get past the air defense. I doubt it, but uh, definitely a long range strike weapon system. Yeah, Hawaii is is really becoming more and more in uh, adversaries' uh, gun sites, isn't it? North Korea, as you're suggesting, possibly the Chinese. Uh, mm -hmm. We better hunker down here. Uh, be careful. Well, um, you know something. Uh, I, I gave a talk at PACOM uh, recently, and uh, talking about some of the research I did at Academia Seneca uh, Institute of Taiwan History while in Taiwan last year and uh, talked somewhat about military affairs as well. And the big question the folks out there had for me was, what is Taiwan's will to fight? So what's your take on that? How would you respond to that? What is Taiwan's will to fight? Hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> I would have to say that it is nothing like the American perspective on you know, we don't. Taiwan has a Marine Corps, and Taiwan has a Special Forces um, group, Army, Navy, and Marines have Special Forces. Um, but and though they're very proud of their tradition, they have no experience. Um, and you have to have some experience, and you have to have some training with other nations and uh, there's very limited training opportunities for these units with mm. America. Um, that's a big problem. If you get down to the regular infantry, you might as well just forget it. Um, you know, I talk to these kids, you know, I, I, I'll go to a local bar here and, and just sit down chew chew the fat with them and talk to them. And then, you know, then they'll say, well, I'm, one or two of them are in the army, and they'll, they'll say, "Actually, though, I'm a wall right now." Ha ha ha. Um, uh, Wendell, yeah. Wendell, let me let me break in here a second. I'm being told we need to take a break. 
let's take oh. a break and we'll come back and we'll pursue this topic because I think this is a topic of interest to a lot of people. Sure. So you're watching okay. uh, Asian Review. My name is Bill Sharp. Uh, my guest today is Wendell Minnick. He's the senior Asia correspondent for Shepherd Media and Military. He's been living in Asia for over 20 years, especially Taiwan. He is a real expert on uh, military affairs. And we'll be right back. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, 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 go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Okay, we're back. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is uh, Taiwan's Will to Fight, and our guest is uh, Wendell Minnie. Uh, Wendell is the senior area correspondent for Shepherd Media and Military. He is a real specialist on military affairs. He's lived in uh, Taiwan for 20 some years and he travels all over Asia uh, reporting on uh, various um, military affairs. Just before the break, we we're talking about uh, Taiwan's will to fight. And uh, so let's pick it up from there. And, you know, I, I think I know where you're going on this, because um, a, a big question I asked people when I was in Taiwan last year is, well, tell me about your military service. And I heard so many times that it was a total waste of time. I wasted mm -hmm whatever period of my life that I was in the military. It was boring. The living yeah. conditions were horrible. Um, it, and it just kind of went on and on and on. And then I asked people, well, um, now let me see. You serve in the military nowadays for four months, and then you're supposed to go to reserve training. So have you gone to reserve training? Oh, no, they never called me. No. And, and well, I've been told well, by sorry. other folks, and these are retired flag officers, because they're a little more talkative, right? That mm -hmm. even if Taiwan mobilized all its two million plus uh, reservists, they probably, uh, their training when, probably they won't be up to standard and they probably won't have enough equipment to equip them all. Is that your take as well? Uh, I'd say that's a nice way of putting it. Uh... <laughs> The, the rude way to say it is that China would rape Taiwan uh, in a war. Oh. Um, it does not have the will to fight. Uh, its infantry is made up of kids who have no leadership from their sergeants, who have no experience in warfare. Um, there, there is open talk that you know everyone has cell phones now that that you know when the when when the flag goes up that parents will just go drive to the base and tell their kids to get in the car and we're going home um there will be a lot of no shows uh, there'll be a lot of a wall um people will simply not show up they'll just disappear um and you know my that's, that's my, pretty grim that's really grim well they don't expect to you know there's no nationalism here it hasn't it hasn't yet transformed to an independent Taiwan identity. It's, it, it's certainly moving in that direction. But they still use the same flag from the KMT, and the uniforms still have KMT symbolism on it. <clears throat> we're talking about the sun. I, I know um, what you're talking about. And right. other symbols. And they need to remove these names and, and I, I, uh, things on there and put Taiwan symbols on their flags, on their patches, uh, stop naming their ships after some river in China. 
um, you know, it, it's it, it's not, and start thinking in terms of what it means to be Taiwanese and try to develop a military culture that is Taiwanese based. I you agree know, with you. Part of this area might be the Aborigines here. Um, it could certainly introduce some new symbolism. Um, the 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 Taiwan Special Forces is full of Taiwan uh, Aborigines mountain uh, peoples that uh, they're about the only ones who can handle this kind of training. And uh, they don't look Chinese. They certainly look more Philippine, Indonesian. Um, they, have a, they have a joke amongst them that the first, people, first Chinese that they would shoot during the invasion would be their own officers. Uh, you know, Gosh, uh, that's telling. But, that is really telling. So, hey, so, well, let me um, let me ask you this. Um, I, I think that you indirectly answered it already, but just so we don't make any mistakes here, what's the morale level in the military? I think people are comfortable. I mean, in four months that they serve now, I think people are fairly comfortable. They don't have a lot to complain about. I don't think that people. You don't hear the horror stories that you used to hear of people being uh, abused unnecessarily. Um, um, you have basic training where you have people coming to you and making sure is the food okay? You know, is your your mom called the last night angry about something? Can you tell us what it was so we can fix it right away? And you know, I mean. Um, you know, you, you hear horror story after horror story of, of parents interfering in the training of their children uh, in basic training in a later infantry school, which is absolutely mind boggling. Um, they don't have that. And there's something else about the culture here. If you go to Korea and you, you meet a young man that's about to go into the Korean boot camp system, you make friends. But when he gets out, you don't. You're not friends anymore. Or something something has changed. The boot camp that he goes into has changed him. Yeah. Uh, the guys who go into boot camp here come out angry that they had to go to boot camp. And and they don't feel particularly um, they don't feel more nationalistic. And that's what boot camp should at least try to instill is a different kind of nationalism and pride. That, that's really something. Um, now, uh, let's, let's move on here, because time always races on here, and as we have a couple more things we really want to touch on. The Ministry of National Defense's uh, QDR um, comes out every year, I guess it is. This year, I, I went through it in preparation for our talk today, and, and they seem to put a lot of emphasis on improving living conditions. Are the living conditions on Taiwan military bases, well, how are they? I, I mean, you've seen them. Oh, yeah, I've been in them. I've slept in them. Um, look, uh, look, come on. Everyone has the internet on their phones. Everyone can use wireless and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And, and when you go into these dormitories, you're stack bunks. You have no air conditioner. You have one of these uh, mosquito uh, coils oh, that stink. Boy. You light them with a match, and, and there is no internet, and you're you're basically isolated from your family and friends. Well, that's okay in boot camp, but that's not okay in the regular army. Um, there is no married housing. There's no if you get sent to Penghu, you're and you're from Taipei, your family doesn't go with you to Penghu. You don't get to see them but every few months. So the military here uh, really has just destroyed families. Uh, and who wants to join the military when their buddies are working for computer companies here in Taiwan and they're having fun and they're enjoying their lives? And then you say, well, I'm, I'm protecting Taiwan from something. And they say, well, Taiwan will become part of China. Don't worry about it. It'll be an economic integration of some sort. Don't, you know. You know I think I see where you're coming from. Thing. I think I see where you're coming from. 
um, mm. since time is always a, an issue here, let's move on because there are a couple of things I'd like to talk about before our time's up. Um, I, I, we have about four minutes left here. The Hongguang, the annual mm -hmm. military exercise. Now, you attend every year, right? Yes, and, I try to. Sometimes okay. I'm traveling. And, and sometimes they do this all on computer, and sometimes they have a computerized portion and some uh, and mix it up with a live fire portion. Um, it's divided into two. Okay. So I read okay. some comments someplace. Um, I wonder if this was something you wrote that this year's Hong Kong was more or less a dog and pony show for the benefit of uh, President Tsai Ing Wen. Did I say that? I, well, if it wasn't you, I take that back, but then it was somebody else. But if you want to own up to it, I'll let you, right here on air. <laughs> uh, all of the press and media shows that attend the Han Guang are basically just shows, a dog and pony shows. That doesn't mean that they're re not real. They are certainly real. They fire their weapons. They uh, demonstrate their, their helicopters and their, their all their abilities are there. It's quite a show. It's just like... It's like watching a movie, and that's what you have to sort of remind yourself of, that this is a choreographed um, attempt to impress the media, and the media takes all this footage, and they put it on the, the wires, and they show the world that Taiwan is ready to fight. Um, but Hong Kong is actually a much larger exercise that expands all over the island and involves a computer simulation. It involves uh, live fire. It involves all kinds of different kinds of drills. Okay. It's a it's a nationwide drill, basically. So my making fun of the once again here we are again back here. Uh, oh my God! Here they do. You know, you can basically set your clock to the next event. Um, so yeah, um, they have exercises every week that I simply just don't go to. Uh, they'll have a drill or exercise. I'm just, I just don't want to get up at four in the morning to go to, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, um, they work very hard to impress people with these Hong Kong. These are the media uh, shows, not the, not the overall effort. Think of Hong Kong as a larger effort, a larger program, okay. island wide, basically. Now, um, I, I know that you wanted to talk about. Uh... And we've got about a minute left here, so we're going to get this in. How China might use Suao, um, port city on the east coast of Taiwan, uh, to dominate the Asia Pacific region? Well, real quickly, let me explain what the problem is that people in Washington don't understand. China is, is expanding its influence. South China Sea is pretty much gone. Mm. It's got iron chains, it's building bases. <sighs> On air defense IDs, what they ADIZ, air defense identification zone there. East China Sea, they have an ADIZ there that encompasses Senkaku Islands. That's the Japanese islands. Our time They're, is just about up here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. But I, 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 I think I could sum up what you're saying here. If China controls Su Al, a port on the eastern coast of Taiwan, it has an ability to exercise great control into the Western Pacific. Because of the depth, the okay. water depth for submarines. Okay, good. It drops right off into the... The evil clock has caught up with us again. It does this every week, unfortunately. We're just going to have to have a slow that clock down one way or the other. But hey, thanks for joining us. You know, you're a wealth of information. And I, I wish we had uh, some more time to talk. We'll have to invite you back here real soon just to continue this conversation because I think we're just getting started. I always enjoy talking. Uh, please uh, tell me when this will be on so I can watch it. Okay. And uh, I will send you an email with a link and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you very <laughs> much for watching today. It was uh, great to have you with us. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks, Bill. You bet. Thank you.